Hey everybody, so this section is going to cover the BLS pharmacology. Things you need to know about drug names. Most of your drugs are all listed by their generic name, but they can also go by three different names. Their chemical name, you know, basically the uh, at the plants when they're making the medications, what they're actually broken down by, what the chemists are calling the names, the generic name, uh, which are most commonly you're going to see between the generic name and the brand name. For example, chemical name acetamide. You can see the chemical compound breakdown there. Nobody generally worries about that, especially in the EMS world. So we're going by the generic name of acetaminophen or the trade name, more commonly known as Tylenol. So Tylenol is that trade, you know, generally you'll have the little R and a circle beside it that show that that's the trade name, kind of the manufacturer's name of it, but it's still all sedimentifin. So, you know, you can get the great value brands, you can get other companies that make a sedimentifin, but the common trade name is Tylenol. Before you give any medication, you need to know why you're going to be giving that medication and analyzing whether that patient actually needs it or not. So the indication for that medication is basically what tells you that that patient needs it. A contraindication is going to tell you why they don't need it or that you can't give it. A side effect is can both be desired and undesired. So what will happen? Because most medications we give, there is a side effect. There is some kind of effect that the medication causes. Sometimes it's desired and sometimes it's undesired. Like so undesired side effects like allergic reactions, things like that. But then there's also side effects that just come at you with it like headaches, sour taste, things of that nature. And you need those because you need to be able to explain to the patient all the stuff you're gonna do. You don't tell them, well, I gotta give you this medicine because I need to. I don't know what it does, but you just need this. You need to be able to explain to the patient the side effects that they may feel and why you're going to give them the medication. Things to consider when giving the medications is the age and weight considerations. You know, pediatric patients generally don't require as much of a dose of medication as adults do. So in their protocols, there will be two different doses depending on the patient's age. Also, sometimes in the weight, you know, if they weigh more, sometimes they need more medication. So all the medications will be administered based on their weight in kilograms. So to figure up a patient's weight in kilograms, you take their weight and you divide it by 2.2 and that equals kilograms. So however many pounds they are, divide by 2.2 equals your kilograms. So a 220 pound patient weighs how much? 100 kilos. And in terms of being allowed to administer that medication, you know, in EMS operations, the EMS personnel fall under the medical license of a physician. So you are basically given orders to be able to give medication. There is offline medical direction, which means you just use your protocols. You have standing orders that, hey, if you have this patient having these signs and symptoms, um, you know, the protocol lays out contraindications, indications for it all. Offline medical direction just means that you're allowed to give it based on your knowledge and your abilities and the protocol. Online medical direction means that you actually need to call and speak to medical command and or to a physician. And uh, when you do that, when you call and you request the orders, you're supposed to give them a full patient report, everything. You don't call them like, hey, I got a guy, I got to give him nitroglycerin. You got to give the full report, full assessment, so that the physician or the medical command operator you're talking to know what kind of patient you have, whether you should be giving those medicines or not. Whenever you uh, are given an order, you need to listen to it and then repeat back the exact order that they give you. If you have any questions or clarifications on that, just always feel free to ask. If you believe they told you the wrong dose or if you believe you should be able to give it and they tell you no, ask for clarification. So once you know the indications, the contraindications, the side effects of the meds, you're able to explain it to the patient, you've received the orders for the medication, or you're able to utilize offline uh, standing orders, 
you got to know those five rights. One is it the right patient? You know, knowing those indications, contraindications. Is it the right time? Because some of the medications are given in certain intervals. So has it been the right amount of lot of time to give a medication? Is this the right medication? Look at it. Some of the medications come in very similar containers. Make sure you're giving the right medication and that you're giving the right dose. Because some medications you're given a total dose that you can give and that might mean that you give them you know, multiple doses of that to reach that dose. For instance, an aspirin, it's 324 milligrams, but you have to give them four aspirin to reach that. And are you giving it in the right route? Most medications are only made to, uh, or, or produced in certain concentrations to where they can only be given certain routes. So if it's a drug supposed to be given intramuscularly, you can't squirt it in her mouth and so on. So you need to be sure you're doing the five rights, the right patient, right time, right dose, right med, and the right route. So with those routes of medication, there are multiple ways that the patient can receive a medication. There's orally, which is just swallowing. Give them the pill or the substance in their mouth and they swallow it. That's known as PO. Sublingually means that you give the medication under the tongue. It's allowed to go under the tongue and dissolve. Sublingually is SL. Inhaled, pretty self-explanatory. That's generally your oxygen, um, your oxygen uh, or nebulized medications, so NEB for nebulized. Intranasal means that it gets sprayed up the nose, such as Narcan, and that's IN for intranasal. Then there's intramuscular and subcutaneous. Intramuscular means that you're actually giving the medication into the muscle. Subcutaneous means that you're giving the medication just under the layer of the skin, but not quite into the muscular area yet. And then intravenous and intraosseous, these are ALS done by paramedics. Intravenous is given through an IV straight into the bloodstream. Intraosseous is going into the bloodstream too, but instead of going into a vein, this is given into the bone using an IO drill because in the middle of the bone is marrow and blood going through his bone, so it still goes in that way. And endotracheal. Not many drugs are given endotracheally anymore, but if the patient gets intubated by a paramedic, some medications can just go down that ET tube and be absorbed that way. Now let's talk about medications that EMTs can actually give in the field. We will cover the medications that EMTs in West Virginia are able to administer. First is activated charcoal, which is in and out. It's an optional thing, not really in any protocols anymore, and kind of nationwide going to the side, but it's a consideration. Then there is albuterol and atrovent, aspirin, epinephrine, whether given a direct intramuscular injection or epipens, oral glucose, oxygen, nitroglycerin, Narcan, Tylenol, and Zofran. Some other medications that you can assist in administering would be that patient's inhaler, helping them give their own nitroglycerin and assisting in the epi auto injector. Those are kind of covered on the national consensus as not every state allows EMTs to give such an array of medications as West Virginia does. First, we'll cover activated charcoal, and as I said before, it's a consideration to know, but in West Virginia, we don't even carry or give this anymore, even nationwide. It's kind of being phased out, basically for the concept that you give it for poisoning. You know, somebody's ingested too much stuff, they just swallowed a whole bottle of Tylenol. You would give it to that to absorb all the Tylenol in it before the stomach metabolizes it but you have to get them to drink it. It tastes absolutely terrible. It looks just like ground up charcoal, blackened and terrible, terrible. Never really ever had any luck with patients self-administering it. If you are someplace that is gonna give it, you give one gram per kilogram. And in most of these bottles, they come anywhere from 25 to 50 grams in a whole bottle. So some side effects that it's going to taste terrible and there is that likelihood the patient could try to swallow it 
and then vomit which we don't once stuff goes in we don't want patients vomiting ever and they could just spit it back at you uh, other contraindications if it's not indicated they have been overdosed and they don't have an inability to maintain an airway so we don't want to squirt it in our mouth and them to choke on it albuterol this is the same medication that generally comes in a patient's puffer or their inhalers the generic name is albuterol sulfate we give it for those patients who are having shortness of breath because of bronchoconstriction or also known as bronchospasming these are patients that are wheezing um, have a history of CUPD such as asthma emphysema chronic bronchitis and the way it works is that patients bronchioles are constricted so they're not moving much airway and this goes in and will dilate those bronchioles to allow better airflow in and hopefully get rid of that wheezing sound that those bronchioles dilating or bronchioles constricting cause it comes packaged in a three milliliter ampule that's just liquid that you'll squirt into a nebulizer and it's 2.5 milligrams some side effects of that is it's going to increase their heart rate it's going to make them very jittery kind of restless and contraindications of course if they're allergic to it and if their heart rates too fast generally a heart rate of about 130 is where it begins to be contraindicated because it's going to make their heart rate go up so if we don't want it to go up too high so if the heart rate is high you just need to make sure that it's high due to the respiratory distress that the respiratory distress isn't because of the high heart rate Atrovent has about the same reactions as albuterol but it just works on the body a little bit different its generic name is ipratropium bromide just called atrovent same thing indicated for that bronchoconstricted patient having respiratory distress and wheezing and it's a bronchodilator it just causes the bronchioles to dilate from a little bit different of an approach on the body than what albuterol does and it also helps stop mucus secretions because when his bronchioles constrict they're inflamed they produce mucus and this also help slow that mucus production it's 0.5 milligrams in a three milliliter solution that will also be squirted into a nebulizer has the same side effects increased heart rate jitterness and is um, contraindicated by allergic reactions to it tachycardia and if the patient just doesn't need it now albuterol and atrovent are commonly combined as you can see in the picture here it's got the pink stripe on it that has ipratropium bromide and albuterol sulfate so in that is a three milligram solution a three milligrams and a three milliliter solution and that's commonly known as an a and a and a duoneb this is what adult patients get because we don't want to increase that heart rate so much on little kids so a and a goes to adults only whereas albuterol is for pediatrics so you don't give those little kids an a and a treatment because we don't want that little heart to get racing way too fast aspirin is the first line medication that we give to patients having cardiac related chest pain so it doesn't mean that the patient was working out in the gym dropped weights on their chest now their chest hurts that kind of chest pain is patients that we suspect who are possibly having a heart attack or known as a myocardial infarction so the way that it works is it is called it uh it's a platelet aggregate where a lot of people think it's a blood thinner it doesn't actually thin the blood it just aggregates the blood prevents the blood clots or the platelets from sticking together and making bigger blood clots because in the event of a heart attack that's caused by a blood clot so if we're going to give them aspirin our goal is to basically lube up all those cells so they don't stick together so if there is a clot causing a heart attack that it's not going to make that clot get any bigger the dose is 324 milligrams orally so we give on the ambulance chewable baby aspirin because we can't give them anything to drink we don't carry water and beverages on the ambulance so we give 324 milligrams and we have them chew it up so that would be four 81 milligram tablets just give them four have them chew it up so some sound effects 
depending on the flavor of the aspirin that you get, is going to generally just be a sour, chalky taste. And a contraindication would be, of course, an allergy to that, or if they have any kind of active bleeding. Because if we want the body to naturally clot off its own bleeding, so if they've got bloody gums, you know, internal GI bleeding, stomach ulcers, things like that, we don't want to give them aspirin because we want that body to clot as it needs to, but we're just trying to reduce that blood clot in a coronary vessel. Epinephrine is given for anaphylaxis, and anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction. Those are the ones generally caused by bees, shellfish, and nuts. A lot of people are exposed to allergies where they get around dust and dander, and their eyes water, they cough, they hack, their skin might itch a little bit, or you get stung by a bee, you get a little bit of a welt. Now, these people, if they get exposed to things, they have the potential to die within a few minutes. So an indication is going to be that anaphylaxis where they have a low blood pressure, their skin's pale, cool, and die of heretic, and they're in respiratory distress. So if their respiratory is affected is the number one big thing. It works as a bronchodilator and a vasoconstrictor because during anaphylaxis, their blood vessels dilate, so we want them to vasoconstrict down. That's why those patients become hypotensive because of the vasodilation and they're having shortness of breath because the bronchioles constrict. So we give them the epi to make those bronchioles not be constricted, it causes them to dilate. And we don't want the blood vessels to be dilated, we cause them to constrict. So epi is a bronchodilator and vasoconstrictor. So those things have to be happening in the body so that epi has an effect on it. We can't give epi to people unless they have something for it to work against. The dose is 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams intramuscularly. So the pediatric dose is the 0.15, adults is 0.3. And that's given intramuscularly, whether via an epi pen, and the pediatric ones come in an epi pen junior, or we have the options to actually draw up epi out of an ampule and give them a shot. We give them the patient an intramuscular injection. Side effects, it could cause hypertension because of the alpha properties making the blood vessels constrict and it'll make the heart rate increase causing that tachycardia, causing blood pressure to go up because that vasoconstriction and causing that jitterness because epinephrine is basically synthetic adrenaline. Contraindications would be of course, any kind of allergic reaction to it, and there's or any kind of known allergy to epinephrine, and if there's no signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. You know, if a patient got stung by a bee and they just got a welt, that's it. Oh well. But if they're having respiratory distress, that's when epi needs to be involved. Narcan becoming very infamous, especially in West Virginia, with the heroin and opiate epidemics. So the generic name is naloxone, but more commonly known as Narcan. It's indicated for opiate overdoses. Those are patients who've taken fentanyl, heroin, uh, prescribed other opiates such as Nubane and other general narcotics. They will have pinpoint pupils and be in respiratory failure or complete apnea. So they may just be breathing a couple times a minute. Basically, if you don't have to bag the patient and ventilate them, they don't need Narcan. The way that works is it blocks the uptake of the actual opioid. So the opioid goes and binds the receptors on the brain and basically makes everything turn off and makes you forget to breathe. So it blocks that uptake in there. And the way that it's administered by an EMT is two milligrams intranasally. You spray half of it up one side and half of it up the other side. So one milligram in the right nostril, one milligram in the left nostril. Some side effects it can be from vomiting. If um, generally intranasally, it doesn't have that effect. If the patient's high gets reversed super fast, they can vomit and they can be combative. Most studies show that the patients won't vomit and won't be combative, you know, given it intranasally and if you ventilate the patient while it takes effect. That Narcan takes about 
you know, three to five minutes on most patients for it to take effect and to make them start breathing again. So you need to ventilate them the whole time. A lot of times when they become combative, it's because their brain's hypoxic because they haven't been breathing for several minutes. So ventilate that patient with oxygen, and most generally they don't come back and be combative. So a contraindication for it would be if there's no respiratory compromise. As I said, if you don't have to ventilate that patient, if they're breathing adequately, they don't need Narcan. Nitroglycerin, we give that for cardiac related chest pains again. And the way that it works is as a vasodilator where epi constricts the vessels, nitro dilates it. Because in the event that if they are having a heart attack and there is that clot, so we gave them the aspirin, try not to let that clot get any bigger. And so that clot's got a small coronary vessel basically plugged up completely. So when we give the nitro, it makes the blood vessels dilate. So it'll make that vessel get bigger so blood can flow around the clot. That's given as 0.4 milligrams sublingually. And it comes in a liquid spray or a tablet. So that would just go under the tongue and it can be given every three to five minutes, generally for a total dose of three times, so 1.2 milligrams. Side effects that will be hypotension because it's a vasodilator. It's going to naturally lower their blood pressure. It can cause a headache from that sudden change in the size of the blood vessels, just irritates the brain a little bit, and some sour taste. Contraindication would be, of course, any allergy to it. If they're already hypotensive, so if their blood pressure is less than 100, the systolic pressure being less than 100, so for hypotensive, you can't give it because it's going to make their blood pressure plummet. And if they've taken any erectile dysfunction meds, such as Viagra, Cialis, or Levitra. So just a little bit of Jeopardy knowledge for you. Whenever Viagra was discovered, it was actually discovered by accident. So Viagra was originally designed as an antihypertensive. So when it went to clinical trials, a bunch of the males, when they were taking Viagra, trying to treat for high blood pressure, actually developed erections. So then the company was like, hmm, maybe we should market it this way instead of as an antihypertensive. So Viagra and those other male enhancements have the tendency to lower your blood pressure anyways. So if a patient has high blood pressure and erectile dysfunction, sometimes they're prescribed the Viagra or Cialis or Levitra, whichever, and it'll kind of work on both or they take lower doses of their high blood pressure medicines. So with that, that's why we can't give nitro with that because they're already on an antihypertensive med with that. So if they've taken it gently, you know, within the past day, it's still in the effect that can still have the potential to plummet that patient's blood pressure. Oral glucose is designed to treat the diabetic who's experiencing low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. So it works just by increasing the glucose in our body because we're giving them straight glucose. It comes in a gelled packet of either 15 grams or 25 grams. And we just give it to him orally. We just give it to him, let him drink it out of the tube. So some side effects are going to be, of course, increased blood sugar and a poor taste. They come in, you know, cherry and lemon are the most common ones, but they all taste terrible. A contraindication for this is if they don't have hypoglycemia and if they uh, have the inability to maintain their own airway. So if a patient's blood sugar is so low, they're unresponsive. We can't go and just squirt this in their mouth if they can't swallow it. So we squirt it in their mouth, they're unresponsive. Next thing you know, we're choking our patient. Tylenol is, uh, the generic name is acetaminophen, more commonly known as Tylenol. We give that to generally the pediatric populations who are having a fever. It is an antipyretic, which means it's a fever reducer. 
the dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram. So this is one of those times where you'll have to do some math because you get 160 milligrams in five milliliters. So depending on how much that patient weighs, you'll have to measure it up in a syringe and you give it to him orally. Just take your syringe, squirt it in the side of their mouth. Because if you squirt it in the middle, they're easier to spit it back out. So you squirt it in the side of their cheek and it makes them swallow it. Side effects can be poor taste and probably a really mad kid. Most little kids aren't real compliant in taking the medicine unless it tastes good like bubble gum. Contraindications again would be the inability to maintain their own airway. So if a kid's unresponsive and super fevered, we don't go and squirt medicines in her mouth. And also if they are not fevered, we don't give it as pain medicine only as an antipyretic fever reducer. And lastly, Odansetron, known as Zofran. We give that for nausea. Okay. The way that it works is it just blocks those receptors that are making the patient be nauseated. It's given as four milligrams and given it orally as an oral dissolving tablet. So they go in, they're not supposed to swallow it or chew it, just put it in their mouth and let it dissolve, that oral dissolving tablet. So some side effects that it can have a poor taste. Most people don't complain about the taste. And a contraindication would just be that it's not indicated, the patient's not nauseated. Also, if they're actively vomiting, you don't want to put one in their mouth because they're just going to vomit it right up. Most generally, if the patient's already to the point where they're starting to vomit and that gag reflex is stimulated, Zofran's not going to do anything for them, but you can try it. And here's just a handy chart of all the West Virginia medicines that are given what the medicine is for, what the dose is, how you give it, what the indications, contraindications, and the actions are. If you'd like a copy of this chart, feel free to ask me and I'll send you a copy of it. Very good chart to be able to use to study those medications. So once you give the medication, you always need to reassess the patient by asking them the questions, checking their vital signs, seeing how it works before you do any other interventions. Okay, so after that, you're assessing the patient and document the time that you gave to the patient, you know, their vital signs were with it, you know, if they, what their pain scale was when you gave them that first nitro, or, you know, what their oxygen saturations were before you gave them the albuterol, and so on. So you continue to always reassess. Now we'll just talk about a few medicines that patients sometimes are prescribed and they take on their own. If you see anything that ends in OLAW, that is a what's called a beta blocker. That means that they've got either a high blood pressure or a commonly fast heart rate or both. It treats whatever is going on in the body. Plavix is a blood thinner. So that's important to know if they're on any blood thinners and they've hit their head or they're a trauma patient and have any bleeding going on. This, to get that in your mind of how hard is this going to be able to control the bleeding, especially older patients who've hit their head if they're on Plavix, very susceptible to having brain bleeds. Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, treat high cholesterol. So if your patient has a history of high cholesterol, which builds up plaque and clots and are having chest pains, could be very possible with a high cholesterol history that they really are having a heart attack. Aside from albuterol and atrovent is Advair, an inhaler that uh, treats asthma and COPD. So if you see ones like Advair, Proair, those are for breathing issues. Metformin or glucophage is a oral medicine for diabetes and also of course the most infamous one of insulin for diabetes. Amoxicillin is a common antibiotic. Hydrocortothiazide is a very common excuse me, hypertensive medication. So if you see that list, you know they've got high blood pressure. And acetaminophen hydrocodone is a pain medicine. So it's a hydrocodone mixed with the Tylenol. So the next video that's gonna come up is going to show you how to assist in, as we call, spiking a bag of getting the fluid the IV fluid and the administration set set up. This is definitely an EMT skill that you can use to assist the paramedic while they're doing an IV. You can be getting the 
IV bag set up ready to go to connect to that IV. So I'm going to show you how to properly set up a fluid administration set. So just a couple basic principal things. So in your bag of fluids, the bottom here, the little rubber safety caps, these are all sterile things. Same thing with your drip chamber. The tip of this is a little cap that comes off the needle. The end of it, a little piece of threads off of the thread adapter that goes into the IV catheter. So you want to make sure you leave these on until you're ready to administer them or put them into an orifice. So we'll start with taking your fluid, removing the safety cap, putting it in waste. Then you want to take off the safety cap of the spike of your drip set. The best tip is holding this upside down. Put the spike in first. It'll wiggle in as far in as you can get it. Now my method, what I like to do, there's different ways to do it, but this is what I prefer. At the end of your drip chamber right here, which is a squeezy part, take the tubing and put a bind in it. So then this way, when you bend it over, you want to start squeezing this chamber so we get the fluid about halfway up through the chamber. Then, whenever you release on that, you release your kink there, it shoves all the air out at once. So then you don't have to be worrying about any kind of bubbles or anything. So then at the end, once you start to get a drip and a flow out of the tip of it, you see there, you leave, even leaving that safety cap on, you can get drips out around that. So that means all your bubbles are out, then you take your little rolling wheel and you roll it to where it's tight. And that pinches off your tubing and stops the flow. Now, your IV administration is set up, ready to go.